So welcome everyone to Saturday Night Thrive. Tonight we have uh, the pleasure of having Sarah McLean with us on the show. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, Sarah is a um, meditation teacher, author. She's written a couple of books that I know about. Uh, there's a Soul Centered, uh, finding the, you know, incorporating meditation into your life in eight weeks. And then there's also from last year, just released also from Hay House, right, Sarah? There's The Power of Attention. Yeah, so both look like really great books. And Sarah here, she's going to talk about some of her work, some of her writing. She's doing a great upcoming workshop at the Retreat Center, which we're really excited about as well. Um, before we get into all of that, uh, let's give a big welcome to Sarah. And then we will uh, turn it over to Mary to start us off with a little a few melodies. How does that sound? Okay, so I'm just going to swivel my computer this time. Okay. Take it from here, Mary. All right, I'm going to play a budget. This is going to be in call and response in Sanskrit. So if you can follow along, you can, or just sit and listen to the beautiful music. <laughs> Without further ado, we'll turn it over to you, Sarah. 
Hi, can you see me and hear me? Hi, it's my pleasure to be here. I just actually uh, returned from my meditation center here in Sedona and uh, I lead a meditation every Sunday at two o'clock. And today there were brand new meditators and it was, it was so beautiful to be with them. And I, you know, I start at the beginning, you know, you never know where people are in their journey. So I, I like to start at the beginning and I don't know how much you know about me, you listeners out there. I know Andrew's done a couple of interviews with me, but um, I've really made my journey through various traditions and brand names of meditation. And um, I really have made it my mission to demystify meditation so that people can really gain the benefits of it, whether they know anything about Durga, which was a beautiful song, by the way, uh, one of the great goddesses of the Hindu tradition tradition um, dedicated to truth and loyalty and activism and uh, but whether you know about her or not whether you know about Hinduism or not whether you know about Vedanta or Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism whether you know about meditation or transcendence whatever the case may be um, accessing meditation and accessing the power of your attention is possible for you and you don't have to have a guru and you don't have to have um, a particular religious belief in order to maintain it. So today I was at this um, meditation center, of course it's here in Sedona, and there were just a few people today because the traffic was unbelievable with everyone on spring break. And um, one therapist in the school systems, but she's an activist for individuality and specifically acting um, on behalf of people who choose to go their own way, who don't choose vaccines, who do want to homeschool their kids, who do want to um, take matters into their own hands when it comes to uh, liberation in their own children's behaviors. I mean, there's a law apparently that if your children are acting out, they can be medicated against their will and against the parent's will. And her heart, who is it who's um, moving her towards this work. And uh, she's, you know, she's so burned out that she doesn't even feel like she knows herself. And this is uh, common for activists, advocates. And um, so I was talking to her about finding moments of sanctuary. And of course, finding moments of sanctuary can occur and uh, feed yourself. And so, you know, Durga, speaking of Durga, she is an activist, an activist for truth, for freedom, for liberation. Um, and, you know, all of us, I think, are being called to activism. I mean, we saw, you know, this is probably an evergreen show, but I'm just going to talk about it. Um, we, we were called yesterday to um, being activists for freedom of speech, activists for speaking out against violence. You know, and, and we look at the Yoga Sutras, free speech, speaking truthfully, as well as nonviolence. I mean, those are two of the, the yamas that we can live by. And um, so we're being called, each one of us, we're being called to step into our power, being called to continually nourish and get those, the wind beneath our wings through our own spiritual practices. And this is really um, what brought me to meditation, or actually not to meditation, but to teaching meditation teachers. I have a meditation teacher academy here in Sedona, where I've taught over 300 meditation teachers from around the world. And the reason I do that is because I know, and I imagine you do if you're listening to me now, we want to have peace on this planet. We want to walk through this world peacefully with freedom with liberty, with justice, with creativity, with connection, with sweetness. And um, I think that we're all having to do that, but I can't reach everybody and you can't reach everybody. And so each one of us is responsible to create that. And I was always reminded of Lao Tzu's poem, or maybe it's his, it's his work, which says, in order to have peace on this planet, there must be peace between nations. That's obviously true. And in order to have peace between nations, there must be peace in the cities 
and I'd add countries and um, in the countryside. And in order to have peace between, in the cities, you need to have peace between neighbors. I don't know about you, but there was a lot going on yesterday with Facebook and people on either side of the equation feeling that someone is wrong and someone else is right. So in order to have peace between neighbors, there needs to be peace in the home. I think about the way we wake up in the morning, the way we meet the day, whether you have children, animals, people you live with, is it a peaceful morning for you? But in order to have peace in the home, Lao Tzu says, you need to have peace in the heart. So as a meditation teacher and a teacher of teachers, I really think I'm shortcutting the whole uh, theory when I strive for peace in my heart and I strive to teach people how to find the peace in their heart. And so this woman, you know, she said she was, had just started meditating two weeks ago. And we were talking about how the goal of meditation is to do it. The goal of meditation is to do it. And we all have different reasons for starting it. Um, and one of the, actually, I, I want to take a moment now and talk to you, Andrew, and see what was it you wanted to make sure I said in this, in this conversation? I, this is great. Really, uh, it's anything that you would like to cover. I have a couple of questions prepared. Uh, for everyone listening, also feel free to send in your questions either via the comments on Facebook or on the chat on Zoom. So it's a very open-ended. Good. And I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I want to talk about the reason attention is so important. Please. I want to talk about the power of attention and the way I got to understanding it. You know, for me, because I've been through so many traditions, I was always trying to find the common ground. What is the common ground between the art of living, uh, Kriya Yoga, you know, transcendental meditation, primordial sound meditation, Zazen, what is, where do we all meet? You know, maybe it's, it's where we enter in from. I mean, whether you're looking to lower your blood pressure or create peace on this planet, whether you're looking to increase your immunity or to be a better listener, um, you know, we're all coming from the same, coming in through similar doors. But what I'm finding is that there are three ingredients to, I'd have to say 95% of all meditations. The first ingredient is your willingness to do it. Right. And it's the willingness is born out of frustration, sometimes out of desperation, sometimes out of a deep heartfelt longing. So the second ingredient for every meditation is your gentle, non-judgmental attention. And this is not just as simple as it sounds. Yes, meditation will make you maybe have Jedi attention, but you don't have to start out that way. You start out with just paying attention like you're paying attention to me and like I'm paying attention to you right now. And the third ingredient is where all of the techniques come in, whether you're paying attention to a sound, a sensation, or some sight. Um, they're all various techniques, but I wanna get back to the second ingredient, gentle attention. Because I talk about it and have talked about it for the last, gosh, since 1993, as I've been teaching meditation since then. You know, I obviously we're all on our own journey. My journey is, ever expanding, ever evolving, just like yours is, like that lotus, that ever blooming lotus that continually, continually shows new petals. So my quest is quite often um, to get to go deeper. And my quest was, well, what is this attention I'm talking about all the time? What is this attention that I'm always referring to? And where, where is it? Point to it. And a, a Zen master might say, well, Show me your attention. You know, where is it? So what I would say to that is, turn your attention right now to the one who's looking through your eyes, to that presence that's beaming through your eyes, that's listening through your ears, that's right here, right now, dwelling in that body of yours, or not. Pay attention to what it is that's paying attention. And if you can track that, track that to its source, whether it's mentally tracking it or physically tracking it or just imagining it, what do you find? What do you find there? So this has been my journey over the last couple of years.
recognize that I am personally in charge of deliberately paying attention. No one can pay attention for me. No one can hone my attention for me. People can certainly try and steal my attention, but it's my job not to let them. And it's your job to become ridiculously in charge of your own attention. And there are many ways to do that. And there are many ways to start to look for ways in which we're distracted and reclaim it again and again and again and again. Because the only way to peace is to be in charge of where and how you focus your attention and on what. Anyway, I see some questions coming in. Um, yeah. Please place your questions here. Oh, I meditate to stay grounded, stay calm, and be more connected to the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. And so, you know, a lot of people say, well, I meditate to become more intuitive, to be more connected to God, to be more connected to my own inner being. And what does that even mean? How do you know you're connected? How do you know you're plugged in? How do you know that this working for you? And I'd have to say my experience is that the benefits of meditation from uh, Cynthia you know, staying grounded, staying calm, and feeling connected to spirit is um, something that is experienced when your eyes are open and you're walking through the world versus having that, I mean, it can happen in meditation, but more likely, and, and maybe even um, more preferred is that when you're walking through the world, you're connecting to another person or you're marching in Washington, or you're writing a letter to your family, or you're at work at the coffee machine or with a client, is to have that connection arise then, then, versus just when in that solitude of meditation where we practice it, if it happens to arise spontaneously, but it's almost as if the benefit of it shows up when our eyes are open and we're walking through the world. That's, that's it, isn't it? Ah, uh, you know, that's, you know, what happens, a lot of people from, and I'm not saying this about you, but some people from other countries have asked the different, to differentiate that, because in other languages, they seem like they're the same thing. Okay, so the three ingredients, right? I say there's your gentle attention, your willingness, and a focus for your attention, which I should say is an object to focus on. You know, it could be a candle flame. It could be the night sky. It could be the sound of the wind in the trees as it's making its way across the red rocks. I want to show you, a, I want to show you what it looks like out my window right now. Um, and I will. It could be some sound you hear in your own body, your heartbeat, your breath. So what I mean is you can focus your attention on an object. We call it an object of focus, a focus, like focus on my finger, you know, but it, it, yeah, maybe I should articulate it slightly better. If you, I want to show you the outside here. If I can hold on. One I don't know if it'll be able to be. If you let it pause for a second, it will pick up. It will. How do can you see it? You can't. I'm going to have to open my window so you can see it. In a minute, I will. It's so beautiful here in Sedona, and I want people to have the experience of it. We've got another uh, comment. Does it matter where you meditate? Well, you know, if you look at some of the traditions, first of all, I'm going to say no. But if you look at some of the traditions, you know, the meditation has been around for thousands of years. Have you ever been to uh, Varanasi and seen where the Buddha gave his first, um, his first lecture? Of course, it was a walking meditation, but the, everybody outside there, they were sitting on the ground around the stupa. But if you went further out by the Jain temple, you'll see where he had his housing, you know, the, the actual monastic setting. And I think some people sit on rocks. If you go to Ramana Maharshi's um, cave, sit in a cave, 
Now it only serves as an echo chamber for all the horns of all the motorbikes and, and the horns of all the cabs. But I think to sequester yourself, uh, meditation is a solitary practice and often. And uh, to sequester yourself into a place where you're really comfortable or as, as stable as you can be, um, and where you'll be not as disturbed as maybe you would be out in uh, the living room of your home. So where you're comfortable, won't be disturbed, and where you can really lose track of time and space. So you're, you're also stable. Um, but that being said, you can meditate anywhere, anytime, on anything. <laughs> so it doesn't much matter. What are some of the uh, obstacles you find that beginners face when they want to start a meditation practice? And how do you help to resolve those? Oh, well, I'd love to hear some of the biggest challenges right now. If anyone has them, feel free. There's a chat bar um, on, on the, the bottom, bottom of your screen. screen. Yes. Yeah, and uh, I can tell you some of the major ones. I live here where you know we're supposed to be a spiritual mecca so everybody wants to have an, a spiritual spirit experience the minute they come here so i have a, a friend of mine who wrote the book what is a vortex his name is dennis andres and quite often people will come to see him and they'll say now you know i want to have that same kundalini experience i had last time or you know i want to feel as connected to my life and to god as i did last time or some people might read about how meditation makes you feel like every cell in your body is like a sex organ. Or some people feel like they're levitating or want to levitate. They've read about that. So I think some of the biggest challenges for med new meditators are, number one, that they have too many expectations about what will happen for them. You know, every one of us is on a unique evolutionary journey. Some people might levitate. Look at Teresa of Avila. She levitated but that might not be your journey. Some people feel an opening of their heart spontaneously, but that might not be your journey. Your journey might consist of a lot of thoughts, a lot of distractions, a lot of to-do lists, a lot of mental static, and that is the way it is initially. Some people expect all this to happen, and as they monitor what's going on in meditation, reaching the gap or transcending, they might say, is this it? Is this it? And as they're doing the, is this it? What they're doing is they're, they're actually inhibiting the possibilities of that opening of consciousness, that spontaneous flowering of awareness. You know, if you ever have uh, roses, you know, sometimes one won't bud and you might just pull it apart and you want to see it bud and you're like, I'll help it. But it ends up like looking like a mess. When we put too much effort into the natural awakening or natural evolution of our own consciousness, we can actually have a, a little bit of a mess on our hands where we get headaches or we have anxiety or we start judging ourselves. So I'd have to say, first of all, is to let go of any expectations. Secondly, to welcome everything in meditation and in addition to expecting nothing. Third is to stop monitoring the experience, but to do the practice with um, resolve, like you might do anything, we'll do the practice with resolve, but let go of whatever expectations you might have or, or whatever results you're expecting. And uh, the, another one is to be really nice to yourself, really nice to yourself. Because, you know, I've heard this said by many different saints and sages, which they say, you know, to have a human birth, whether you believe in reincarnation or not, that's up to you. To have a human birth is very fortunate. To have a human birth where you're striving or having the, the kernel of desire for enlightenment is extremely rare. So those of us who are listening to this right now, um, it's an extremely rare path. Most people aren't on it. It's a difficult one it can lead to a lot of challenges and it's designed especially for you. And so when we let go of the expectations about when we're going to get enlightened or when we're gonna see God or when we're gonna levitate or when we're gonna uh, be more intuitive or connect with whatever we wanna connect with, when we let go of that and have this great faith as we walk our path, then we're gonna get the best medicine, so to speak.
That's my belief. Yeah. So that's uh, those are the real problems: is too many expectations, being really hard on yourself, and uh, oh, quitting before the miracle happens, whatever that might be for you. I'm going to read some of these other little questions. Yeah. From Tom, we have a, I meditate by counting 10 breaths and beginning again at one, but I get a bad headache almost every time I try. Can you suggest a way to avoid the headache? Thanks, yes. Tom. Hi, Tom. Well, yes, I practiced this for a very long time in the monastery. This was our initial practice. Now, there are many ways to do it, and I'm just going to share that with everyone, um, just because you might hear ways the right way anyway is the right way, but you have to choose one and stick with it. And here's how it might go for you. So you sit down like Tom does and you make a resolve that you're going to count to 10. I don't know about you, Tom, but what I was taught is every time I lose track, start thinking about something else. I was the cook in the monastery, so I thought a lot about food. I also thought a lot about uh, falling in love. So those are my two basic distractions in my monastery. Um, so I would count one on the in-breath, two on the out breath, three on the in breath, four on the out breath, and continue to do that. Now, sometimes I get to 20 and not even recognize that I'd even hit 10. So of course, you know, I was distracted then. There are other practices where you just breathe on the count on the in breath and other practices where you count only on the out breath. So let's just, just so that everybody knows there's a possibility to do it. But the key word in your sentence was the word try. He said, I get a headache every time I try. Now, I don't know if you've seen that movie, but I think it was, um, I can't remember. You'll, you'll have to tell me, you'll type it in here, but it's uh, do or do not, there is no try. Star Wars. Star Wars, right? Yeah. Um, and I, had, I have to say, I never watched the movie, but I did hear about it. And uh, I, I haven't watched any of the, the big blockbusters like Titanic or Star Wars or any of that. So call me weird, but I spent a lot of time with my eyes closed. Um, so do or do not, there is no try, right? What does that mean? That means either you put your attention on your breath and on counting, or you don't. There's no trying to put your attention on your breath. For instance, right now, let's put your, let's put every one of us, let's put our attention on our own breath. Now, put your attention on the sounds in the room around you. Now, put your attention on any round shapes in your environment. Okay. Now, reflecting on this exercise, did you try to listen? Did you try to pay attention to your breath? Did you try? You probably tried a little harder on the round shape, but you were just able to do it. There's not a lot of efforting, and so it's kind of like this effortless effort that you're doing. So in terms of you, Tom, quite often people either focus on something that they're an internal sound or a sensation. In your case, you're doing both because sometimes the, the sensation of the breath is not charming enough, whereas other times um, the sound isn't charming enough, so you're using both. My suggestion is, first of all, notice whatever effort you have. Notice when you're beating yourself up or expecting something to happen. unlatch itself from your experience, but really start to, um, I'm getting a little distracted by the sounds of what sounds like a hurricane on, is anyone else hearing this or is it just my computer? I am. You're too. hearing? Yeah. <laughs> like, woo, primordial sounds. Um, so I would say, notice how much effort you're putting in there and be really kind to yourself. Be really, really kind to yourself as you're going for this. That doesn't mean give yourself permission to daydream, but keep coming back. That's This whole thing is about training your attention, training your attention to focus on one thing at a time, to be in the present moment, and with your eyes closed, to become much more self-aware. 
That's my, that's my suggestion. Okay, Cynthia says she usually falls asleep, so I guess I'm doing it the wrong time of day. Well, let's talk about the times of days to do it. Well, there's what's called the ambrosia hour. Have you heard of this? The ambrosia hour? It's the time monastics would normally get up and meditate. In the, mona in the monastery where I lived, the, they started hitting the, the big block and waking us up at 4.20 in the morning. That means something else to other people. But at 4.20, we we'd get to the zendo at 4.50 and we'd meditate. The ambrosia hour is that time, ideally in Ayurvedic world, it would be between four and six, whether it's AM or PM. It's For those of you who love Ayurveda and know about it, it's that vata time. It's the end of vata time. Vata is naturally cool, light, moving, airy, unstable, and also naturally spiritual. So that time helps to develop the stability within yourself. It's a time that is naturally a spiritual time before the sun arises. Of course, this adjusts slightly depending on where you are, but between 4 and 6 a.m. and 4 and 6 p.m. are the best times. You don't have to do it for two hours each time, but those are the best times to meditate. And um, Cynthia says she falls asleep. I want to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to just give you, there are three categories of experience that I like to share uh, with meditation. The first one is that you have a lot of movement. Now, it could be movement of your mind as in thoughts or visuals. It could be movement of the body as in pain and discomfort or twitching or uh, even the feeling of lightness. And it could be movement of your emotions, sudden heart opening or some grief, um, even some fury that quite often happens. So there's movement as one category of experience. There is um, sleep. It's another whole category of experience and it happens to many people. And I'll tell you why in a moment. And then there's the third category of experience, which is transcendence. Now, transcendence and sleep are very similar in that both of them um, are, are when you lose track of time and space. So when you transcend, when you kind of feel like, where am I after you start taking a deep breath or time's really passed, so that's why you need an objective measure of time. When you have that transcendence state, it can feel a lot like sleep, but there is one factor that is different between the two. And the factor is that in sleep, Cynthia, if I called your name while you're sleeping, you might not hear me. But if you're sitting with me and meditating and I say, hey, Cynthia, you know, will you turn the lights down or close that door behind you? Even though you might have just been transcending, you would immediately, it's almost as if your, your beam of attention, if you're paying attention to your breath or a mantra or, or whatever it may be, um, your beam of attention in meditation starts to expand into a big, wide aperture of awareness. So you, your attention moves to its source, which is awareness itself. And it loses track of the dimension, the duality of time and space. And then if all of a sudden I say, Cynthia, you'd be, what? But if your awareness is expanded and you're unplugged as in, turned it all off in sleep. And I said, Cynthia, you'd just be like breathing deeply in that state of unpluggedness and you might not hear me. So the difference between sleep and transcendence is awareness. Sleep is a dull state of awareness. Transcendence is an alert state of restfulness. So you might be doing it at the wrong time, but I can tell you that um, if you do it in the morning when you first get up, and you, if you have time to do a second time of day, it's what I call happy hour between four and six when you get home before you eat dinner. Um, if you do that, your sleeping patterns will get better in the evening. And so people hear all the time that meditation is a great way to get some good sleep. And it is, but not because you've done it right before bed, but because you've gotten rid of the stress that has kind of inhibited the natural rhythms that your body's gotten into. Um, and so you will eventually be able to sleep more naturally, more deeply if you meditate twice a day and get rid of that stress that impedes that. So I hope that helps a little bit. Okay, we see some more questions. We've got a comment from Tom, a very helpful Sarah, thank you. 
And then uh, from Denise, my practice has helped me find my truth. Thank, thank you, Sarah McLean. Love to you. Cultivating non-judgmental attention feels like settling into love consciousness. I know that you speak of this. I would love to hear more. Well, uh, just like when I said you're, you're paying attention to whatever it may be in your meditation. Now, an advanced technique, by the way, does not have that third ingredient of an object. So what does that mean? Usually the meditations I teach and work with are focused awareness practices, but there are practice that are practices which are open awareness practices. And, and that would be when you're sitting and you've cultivated this deep stillness and then you welcome whatever is calling you, whether it's the sound outside, you know, your own sensation of breath, maybe the sound of your heartbeat, you know, it's, it's, it's almost as if you're a screen and whatever comes, you pay attention to without a lot of gyration storytelling mentally. It's just, a, it's a sensation, sensation, sensation. But back to um, the open awareness or the, op the, let me just read the word you said exactly. Um, I don't know if I can find it, that one. Oh, can you read it to me again? You're muted. <laughs> Cultivating non-judgmental attention feels like settling into love consciousness. Okay, good. So, I uh, thank you, Andrew. I can't find it on there. So the, it's true. So that focus of yours, as I said, it starts to expand as you settle into that non-judgmental attention, into that settled state as you move from the, the active mind, you know, that are indicated if you were to hook up an EEG machine, we'd find this activity of the beta activity going into the alpha. And then as you meditate more, counting, whatever it may be that you're doing, you start moving into of things. Because when you, um, when you say you feel like you're feeling love, it, it, that would be a feeling, it would have to be you you know, the subject and that which you pay attention to, that feeling of love. So there's that still that duality. As you move even deeper into that, I say what happens is you dive into or sink into a field of love. That's what I believe the source of your attention is. That's what I believe you are, is this expression of love. And that's why the non-judgmental attention is nice because it, it's letting you, it's letting you let go. It's letting you uh, surrender to that expansion of consciousness, which ultimately allows you to dive into this field of love. And this is the, this is where the benefits of meditation really arise as you, you purify your nervous system. That's a, a result of meditation. You dive deep into who you really are, which is this present, unique, um, expansive, infinite, timeless being. That's why when you're in that state of transcendence, you don't know what time it is because you're in the timeless world. You're in the love world. You're in the, the healing world, the wholeness world, the um, purity world. You're in that. And you can't think about going there. It just happens spontaneously, which is why giving yourself a break is helpful because the minute you let go, it might happen. It's just like uh, all the good things in life, whether it's falling in love or having that peak experience. It doesn't happen because you wish it into being. It happens because you set yourself up to succeed and let go of your attachment to the outcome. So that field of love is what is our source. And as we dive into it through meditation or other practices as well, but as we dive into it, we don't even know we're in it like a fish doesn't know it's in water. And then as we come out of meditation, we are wet with or covered with the, um, the qualities of that field of love. Obviously, love is one of them. Connection is one of them. Understanding and benevolence and um, wisdom, perfect orderliness, consciousness, all of it, peace, love, all the good stuff, that's what's in that field of love. And so when we move into meditation, whether we know it or not, we're, that whole field of love is kind of calling us. And we know it. You meditators know it. It calls you like, hey, come on back here. 
And for those of you who miss a few meditations or even a year of meditations as some of you have, I always think of that field of love. It is a lover and meditation is a lover. And so it's always welcoming you back with open arms. It does not have any spite or holding any, it doesn't hold any grudges or doesn't separate from you. You can always go back to it. It's always waiting for you going, hey baby, come on back. So that field of love is what lives through you as you. And it lives through me as me. And it lives through everything, even the people we don't really like. It lives through them too. And once we start to recognize that, and you don't have to believe me, by the way, don't believe anything I'm saying. It becomes a direct experience if you practice meditation. And you, you start to watch the, you know, the word in Sanskrit is lila. You start to watch it and you could observe it. I mean, yesterday I had so many, so many sort of uh, controversial posts on my Facebook page from the people who support the Second Amendment and the First Amendment and people who love these kids and the people who don't and, and all of this. And, you know, I have my opinions and that's my personality. But, you know, what's, what shines through all of that is this field of love where I can really be the observer and just laugh. It just makes me laugh, even when it seems really serious and tragic. I know that sounds maybe cold and heartless, and I don't recommend it for anybody unless it's really true for you. You know, what happened for me when I first got into meditation is um, I put a bumper sticker on my car that said, it's all good. It's all good. And it wasn't for me. My car didn't even go into reverse. I had to push it out of the parking lot. So that was bad. I was suffering from heartbreak from a boyfriend who broke my heart. And I also had just gotten um, a tumor removed from my, my throat. So it wasn't necessarily all good in the scheme of things, but I thought in order to be spiritual, I put a, it's all good bumper sticker on my car and pretended it was spiritual. Everything was good and it wasn't. But I can tell you that from my perspective now, in most cases and not every, I'm still triggered by a number of things which you can find out about on my personal face, Facebook page. But um, in most cases, I see the intelligence I see the light behind the movie screen and behind all the characters that are being, it's being shown through. You know, I can see it, but that's just because I've been meditating for a while now, 25 years or something. But do you see it, Andrew? You know, from time to time, there are certainly things that uh, can disturb the mind, but it is, a, uh, you know, it brings a certain amount of relief to be able to look at a, a tense situation, whether with colleagues or family and to have a lightness around it. Yeah. Sarah, also, could you share a bit about, uh, you know, the course that's coming up and what will be offered there? Well, you know, it really starts with an examination of your attention. You know, what triggers you, what calls you, where do you, where do you spend, where do you pay your attention? Um, Noticing your habits of mind, your, your reactivity, maybe where you dwell, uh, whether you like it or not. Well, we start there and we also really talk about mindfulness and do some mindfulness practices. We, uh, we do a lot of self-inquiry practices as well. And it's really uh, diving in. First of all, beyond all of that, the Art of Living Retreat Center is so beautiful. I mean, it's Mary, the word is sattvic. Some of you know that word. It, it means uh, pure and nourishing. Certain field of love, I would have to say. And so there's that. And the meeting room is beautiful. Um, the houses, the places we stay are beautiful. The, the spa is really one of the best spas I've ever been to. It's a traditional Ayurvedic spa. And I worked in an Ayurvedic spa for many years, many different ones. So I can tell you that with some authority. Um, I just love it there. And, and I love to dive deep into that stillness. Um, we do a lot of meditations. I talk more about expansion of awareness, that flowering of consciousness, and exploring the power of your attention. Where do you want to focus it? What does it take to be um, powerful in this world, the Durga of you? Know, you? What does it take to hold up this truth and hold up this power and hold up this um, clarity and this sort of discrimination? And, you know, every one of us is 
being called at this point to live a powerful life. And it's not the power of it's not the power of threatening anyone or competing with anyone, but it's this true personal power. And, and how do you access it? Even when you're scared or tired or on the to-do list is a mile long or your responsibilities seem to be overwhelming. And so, you know, we really talk about that. And we also learn how to express ourselves um, from that place of strength. You know, yeah, sometimes we move from victimhood to victor, and that's also part of the journey. And so my hope is that when you come, that you, um, we all come into this from where we are, right? So some of us have been meditating a long time. Some of us are brand new to it. I never judge anyone's level of enlightenment because I have no idea. I don't even know what my own is. So we don't judge, you know, you're this and you're that. But what we do is we bear witness to each other's um, hearts. Um, our souls, our expressions, our passions, and uh, we support each other. And there, you know, there's not a lot of places you can do that. I mean, hopefully you you have a place like that where you live, but if you don't, you might need to get on to a retreat so you can at least have, um, you know, a touchstone for the next time you feel like life is tough, you know. So I don't know. Is that is that what you want me to talk about? I want to look at some of these other comments because there's so many and I can't read them from my That's teeny screen. Great. Um, one thing is we've put up the uh, the link to Sarah's upcoming program. We're really excited about that. That's in the comments on Facebook and the chat on Zoom. Um, there are a couple other questions. Eyes open or closed. My problem is I lay down. Uh, so no wonder I call it sleep. <laughs> Um, people would like to know if you have YouTube videos and if it's open to Christians. Are you kidding? It's open to everybody. <laughs> Unless you cannot think a thought, then it's not open to you. But if you can think a thought, you can meditate. And probably if you can't think a thought, you can meditate. But I am going to put up my YouTube channel Great. and I'm going to also show you something really fun. It's... Um, I don't know if you can see this because I don't know how many people are actually watching versus listening. Do you? Um, it's a mix and we also have people joining on Facebook. So there's a few different channels. Okay, hold on. Now there's that. Did you just get that link? Um, I didn't. Okay, and let me get this other one. And then I'll post them both. Hold on one second. Oops, lost you. There you are. So there's, this is the YouTube station. It's, um, it's got tons of meditations. And here is one that I recommend for everybody. It's Christian, Jewish, Islam, uh, Sikh. Um, there's Sufis. There's so many. It's called feastforthesoul.org. It's a not-for-profit organization that I recently became the director of. It's oh. free. Nobody makes any money doing this except for maybe our web designer. <laughs> and uh, we've got hundreds of hours of meditation on there um, from contemplative Christian to contemplative poetry to the Kabbalah. Um, so many beautiful, beautiful meditations on there. And I recommend that for anyone. I, I have probably 40 meditations on there, maybe 50 that you can listen to, but I'm not alone. There are tons of beautiful, beautiful meditation features. Speaking so of which. Uh, mm -hmm. Do we have time for a brief meditation before we uh, close out tonight? Yes. I just want to make sure I've answered some questions about meditation. Sure. Um, there was another question, which was uh, a little, if you could explain a little more about what do we need while meditating? Is it focus or attention? Oh, okay. Well, it's, you certainly need your ability to focus your attention on an object. You know, I don't know, for some of you who've read the Yoga Sutras, um, they, they talk about Samyama. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's the three, it's a Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. It's the last three limbs of the Ashtanga, the eight limbs of yoga. If you don't know what I'm saying, pay no attention, but this is for the people who care about that. Um, in general, those three limbs are are what we're focusing on. The mindfulness is dharana, being able to attend your attention to some object. So there's you and there's the object, right? And as you're being mindful, it's just this relationship between you and that what you're paying attention to. 
So that's, that's what I'm calling the focus, but we'll call it an object. Then as we perfect that practice, which only happens with practice, um, that's why we practice meditation. As we do that, we're able to sustain our attention onto that object of our focus. So that's dhyana, that's meditation. Now, what happens at a certain point in time that nobody can predict, nobody can plan, you can't pay anyone for this to happen, is at some moment in time, the separation between the subject and object, between you and the object that you're focusing on, uh, dissipates and there's fusion, there's fusion. That's samadhi. Samadhi is another word for enlightenment, for a momentary enlightenment. It's not necessarily sustained all the time, but there's this awakening to the reality of life. And as in any fusion, which is going on right now with the sun, there's uh, gamma rays and there are photons that are created. Photons, it's funny that we talk about this awakening as enlightenment, and photons are particles of light. So in general, yes, in general, you need an object to focus on to sustain your attention, to create the conditions for this merging between subject and object, this merging between your limited focus of attention to that field of its source, that field of love. That's really what we're doing here. And you don't have to know any of this. That's the beauty of it all. You could be staring at a sunset and it could happen. You don't have to know any of these words or any of these techniques because it is a spontaneous and natural experience for the human. Probably animals have it all the time, I imagine. But uh, for humans, it's natural. It's something that we have to cultivate though in our busy society, in our heavy to-do list laden society. So, okay, so we can meditate, which shall we? Is there any, or do you have any other questions? Ed? That's it for now. You're muted. Do you have any other questions for me? That's it for now. Okay. <laughs> All right, this is my, um, I use this to, I don't know how it sounds on the internet, but it's my Tibetan bowl. I use it to time us with. How much time do we have? A few minutes? Yeah, it's really, uh, it's flexible. It's up to you. Uh, usually we go to about eight uh, Eastern, but it's, uh, you can take what time you need. Okay, so we'll do it. We'll just do a, a 10 minute meditation. We'll go over by 10 minutes. But listen, if you're driving, don't do this. If you are operating heavy machinery, now's the time to turn off this recording. So meditation, I saw a question here. Should your attention or should your eyes be closed or open? Um, that's up to you. You know, there are open-eyed meditations. What you use is a soft gaze, a drishti, as they call it, a soft gaze. Some pe people in the uh, Zen tradition, when they're doing zazen, they gaze towards the floor, like about three feet in front of you, just gazing though, not focusing, but gazing. And... Um, I like to have my eyes closed because I like to have that inward stroke, that interior awareness. But you do what you want, um, whatever is comfortable for you, ideally sitting up because as we've learned, when your eyes are closed and you're lying down, it sets you up for a nap. And that's a different state of consciousness than meditating. So, so let's um, get in a meditation position. That means comfortable, comfortable. Now I have my door closed. Hopefully no one comes in. And that's what you usually have to do. Set yourself up to succeed. And I'll sound the bell. And as I do, simply settle into yourself. We'll meditate for about eight or nine minutes. We'll leave a minute to come out slowly. And with your eyes closed, you can deepen your breath for a few breaths. Breathing in slowly and deeply through the nose and breathing out slowly and fully through your nose. This sends a signal to your body 
that you can relax, you can move to the parasympathetic response, time to rest. And you can let your breath return to its natural rhythm and depth. Throughout this practice, you'll be breathing naturally. There's no need to regulate or control your breath. With your eyes closed or capped, you might begin to notice that you're a little more attentive or aware of the sounds in the environment. So take a moment now and welcome everything you hear. Tune in to the sounds of the sounds. Notice how they arise from the silence and return to the silence, like the sound of the bell and the sound of my voice. Also, as you're meditating here, you might become more aware of the physical sensations that are present right here, right now. Just as sounds are in the present moment, body sensations arise in the present moment. So I'll guide you into a gentle body awareness practice. Remembering to maintain a non-judgmental attention and some kindness toward yourself as I guide you through this. You might become aware of warmth or coolness, heaviness or lightness, tingling, numbness, sharpness. Whatever you find, it's perfectly fine. See if you can notice and welcome everything without any particular evaluation or judgment bringing your bare attention to the sensations as you pay attention now to the scalp, and your forehead, and notice what's here. Noticing your brow, and the sensations in your eyes and your eyelids. Bring your attention to your ears. Noticing what's here. Without going into a story or any judgment, simply sensing. Bring your attention to your nose and your nostrils. Your tongue. your trachea, you can tuck your chin just a little bit as you feel the back of your neck lengthen. Notice the sensations present. Softening your throat and lowering your shoulders. Can you feel your clothing touching your skin? Can you feel where your arms are resting in your lap? Notice the sensation in your palms and your fingers.
And bring your attention to the sensation of sitting as you let your weight be supported by the chair or wherever you're sitting. Perhaps you're leaning against something and your back is being supported. Notice the sensation of support and of pressure, of gravity. The mind wants to drift into another time and place, but the body is always right here, right now, waiting for you. This is a practice of paying attention. Noticing your belly, your hips, your pelvis. Bring your attention to your legs, noticing where they meet the floor, and where your arms are resting in your lap. Notice what the lap feels like. And now allow your awareness to expand. Allow your awareness to expand to include your entire body. Tuning in to any sensation of aliveness, whether it's the rise and fall of your chest as you breathe, or perhaps the pulse on your fingers, whatever you notice, Tune into what it feels like to be alive in this body. And notice where you begin and end. Deepening your breath now. Breathing in slowly and deeply through your nose. Breathing out slowly and fully through your nose. Becoming aware of the space around you, and the sounds around you. You can slowly begin to open your eyes whenever you feel ready. There's no rush. It's always important to come out of that meditation experience into the waking state with ease and grace, taking those transition periods seriously. You can deepen your breath. You can move into the space around you. Take a moment to appreciate yourself for your commitment to this journey and putting your spiritual practice first or at least near the top of what's important to you. When you're ready to open your eyes, you can open them all the way, but take your time. There's no rush.
So that was about 12 minutes, all told. We started a little slowly and came out slowly. And whether you meditate for one minute or five minutes or 10 minutes, it's always important to come in and out of meditation slowly. Just like you go into sleeping slowly, you come out of sleeping hopefully slowly without your phone. The same is true for meditation. You know, even if we don't think we went very deep, it's a different state of consciousness we access with meditation. It's different than being awake. It's different than sleeping. It's different than dreaming. It's the meditation state. It's what's called the fourth state of consciousness. And so as we move in and out of these various states, we take our time. I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges for people. Is they have to get up and go. They have to get back to the to-do list. But don't do that to yourself. Give yourself the benefit of the experience you just had. Allow yourself to move into and out of each state with, with ease, honoring those transitions. <laughs>